Rokan 23. That's right. It is here. It's not back. It's here. It's the first one. Join the ultimate celebration of digital content with its creators, passionate fans, and industry experts. It is all happening in downtown Waco across multiple venues, January 20th through the 22nd of 2023. Now, if you want to go, you got to get tickets, and tickets are on sale at roguecon23.com. That's roguecon, R-O-G-U-E-C-O-N 23.com. Be there. I'm going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. Let's go. Coming up on the payoff, Clint is a guy who has always had what I've wanted. Now, what does that mean? That means for me, when I walked into the rooms of 12-step recovery, I guess my first meeting was 2002, where I met Clint. Uh, It took me 10 years to get one year, do the math on that. But from that moment on, where a guy like this comes into your life, he starts to say things that you carry with you forever. Sometimes a forever is outside the walls of sobriety and getting drunk, but you hear these positive voices still kind of moving you back towards a solution. Lucky for me, I made it back uh, so I could hear more of Clint, and his message is outstanding. Uh, his son was actually, we'll say, featured on this podcast. He was one of our first guests. His son is, is Tim Brooks, and uh, Tim has an amazing story. Uh, got in big time trouble with the law, has turned it around, and uh, what he's doing in the world of sobriety and recovery uh, is unbelievable. And of course, Clint, his father, was along for the ride, the good and the bad. And we get into all of that today. Uh, you know, another thing we talk about, which I always get wound up or, or have trouble getting my head around, is the fact that, you know, your feelings, and Clint says this, your feelings are like the weather, right? If you're an alcoholic, you can't control them. And they're going to change. And there's things like that that you hear time and time again in this podcast that uh, I think will help you get a lot out of it. All right. But before we get to our man, Clint, Kevin Souza. Yeah, this is the first, uh, you know, I, I haven't even had both of my brothers on. So this is the first. We had Timmy on early on, and now having Clint on, it's, uh, this is, you guys are the first two family members. Wow. Well, um, we could keep going with my family. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> Mine too. We're not, we're not finished yet. Now, Allison, say hello. Hi. That's Allison. She's going to be, uh, she's our producer for today, but it's just going to be, you know Great. how it goes. Hey, Allison. Uh, I'll uh, I'll give like an intro, and then you and I will just go into it. So if you're ready to if you're ready to get going, we can start. Yeah, whatever you want, dude. You, you run the show. I'm All right. So, I, yeah. Well, you've been a part of my life for a long time. Uh, back to the first crack I took at getting sober was in 2002, and you were one of the guys who. How, how much? What's your sobriety date, Clint? Uh, 93. No, uh, 11, 13, 93. So you had about nine years then, and you were, you were just living the sermon. I mean, I'm sure you could say say it differently, but to me, it looked like, wow, here's a guy. You had a lot of stuff to say. It was a attraction, right? Not promotion, and uh, it was really cool to, uh, to to hear what you had to say. And then when I finally got it per se, and I came back around, you were there again with with a lot more time. Uh, and you've had a great influence on me, and I know a lot of other people who I respect, so it's great to have you here. Well, I, what I remember most is uh, just liking you instantly and and hoping that you'd have the life you have today. And I, I remember, you know, as you know, we keep track of people uh, when you don't see them for a while. And I remember somebody, I can't remember who it was, but somebody told me you were out doing some more research and just you know, said a lot of prayers your way and, and, uh, and just so delighted you're back in my life and just, was just, you know, no regrets, right? Yeah. I, you know, and that's the thing. It's but, like, but God willing, some people, and we see it today, it's like, don't make it back alive. It's different. It's definitely different. You know, I think the game right now is just to keep people, you can't get sober if you're dead, right? So you, we just got to keep people alive. The stuff that people are messing with is different. Yeah, it, it is different. It, 
it's horrifying. I mean, I, I certainly had thought he'd die, but it was always, uh, it was never an overdose. It was, it was car accidents or, you know, doing something super risky while hammered. Uh, and it just, that feels different than somebody dying because they were trying to catch a buzz and some dealer put some junk in it that wasn't ever supposed to be in it. That's the stuff that just, I just, I can, I can never get my head around it. How, how involved are you? Real. In, yeah, it is real. How involved are you in the recovery community aside from, you know, you're just being an active participant within the 12 step community with AA and stuff? Oh, I, it's, I live it, man. And, and I think the longer I've been around, the more it's just become, uh, my life's gotten a little smaller related to it. I used to do a lot of other volunteerism that was outside of AA and rehabs and things like that. And I just, um, about a decade ago, I got to a place where it was like, hey, this is something um, that I'm passionate about. Um, I understand. I live. And I put uh, all my time that's not family and work and recreational uh into it so uh i'm on the boards of some rehabs and um uh as you know from timmy helping him with uh with what he's trying to do which to me is just magical and um and just, just what, what's the what's so the name of that place again it's uh it's called synergy houses so Sy- he's yeah. uh he, he came to me and a couple other guys in my timmy of course for yeah, those who don't cool. know is, is your son yeah, and and it's cool, you know. I got a, like a guy I sponsor is on the board with us as investor, and and um, he looked at the at the whole kind of recovery industry and saw in the structured sober living place that um, there was room for improvement. There was there was a lot of a lot of people trying it, a lot of people with great intentions, and and a lot of facilities that people went to that really needed help that that weren't delivering on what he was promising. I think there's some gems out there, but, you know, I think he's trying to figure out a way to um, create communities where, you know, the norm is that people thrive and find the life you and I have as opposed to the rarity. Yeah. And, um, you know, and kicked it off right in the middle of a pandemic, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Communal living was not ideal. And, uh, so, so, you know, big part of that, those just, kind of strategically and uh, and financially as far as, you know, buying properties to, that you can bring residents in and, and also um, connected with a lot of the guys that are in it and who have now become part of my life. And, um, you know, it's just, it's been an awesome thing to do with Timmy as well. A lot of those and, guys And, and are as you know, just, yeah, I mean, just great, great. Now, everybody, right? Everybody's yeah. a good guy. It's just, we got sideways in life. Yeah. Upside down, right? I mean, it's so. Let's get into your story a little bit. You remember your sure. first? You remember your first drink? You remember or, or or taking drugs? How old were you? Paint the picture. Yeah, no, vividly. Like uh, summer before tenth grade year, um, and you know, I was a guy that um, had exposure to this through some family, and uh, wasn't. Uh, you know, I would say the week before I drank for the first time. I would have comfortably said I was never going to drink. Just one day, it seemed like a good idea. Uh, I went after it, and um, and the next day, I was never not going to do it. And uh, and I I did I drank and and the drugs on the same night both for the first time. Like I didn't like my first buzz was uh, turns out if your first buzz was that big, you you end up chasing it for the rest of your life. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> which is what I did. Yeah. I mean, it just was like, I went from literally scared of it to fully committed, sacrifice all the opportunity I had in my life to maintain it. And, you know, started and, and was on paper, um, look like what they teach you in, in schools, right. That they teach parents in schools, like graves drops, you know, activities that I was way into became less important. Um, just instantly became began to struggle uh, and then put up a really good facade, right? Like just a gift of gab and tried to convince people everything was fine when, when it clearly wasn't. Yeah, the, the, really show, cool the show game starts life. early. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I was super lucky, right? Like born in, in a place that I didn't deserve to get born into uh, with access to great education and cool things and, never, never wanted anything really. And, um, 
and part of that came with parents that you know put people in my life, uh, uh, teachers and and coaches, and who who saw who saw me for who I was and tried to influence me, and and I just I couldn't hear it, and I rejected them and, and got resentful about it and and um, bitter, and and I look back now and. and Fortunately, some of them I've been able to cycle back to and, you know, honestly thank them for trying to teach me to be a human. And I just couldn't, I wasn't old enough or mature enough to get it or see it. But I'm super grateful they tried. How much different did your attitude get um, when when you, like when you started to drink? You know, because you said comfortably a week before you said you wouldn't have never drank. You you, you could have said that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was, gosh, what it. It was relief. It wasn't like I was a happy kid who had life figured out. I, I, you know, alcohol, you know, and I'm a guy who believes it doesn't really matter, right? There's, you can, alcohol, you can smoke it, you can chew it, you can start it. For me, it was booze. I, I tried a lot of the other stuff, um, but the thing I loved was, was booze. And, um, and I, uh, it just made life easy in a way that I'd never experienced before. And, and, um, and there was no part of it that was social. From day one, I was, you know, drinking alone, hanging out, didn't care, like was happy if you wanted to join me, but was happy if you didn't. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a early, early sign, right? I mean, the same, same thing for me. I remember when I figured out that I could drink by myself and have just as much fun or more than I did with other people. And this was in high school. And I thought I'd really yeah, discovered something. Yeah, I was in high school too. Yeah, yeah I, was in, I was in a boarding school with I would I would take cases of beer and put a tapestry over it so it looked like a trunk, you know, and it was just coffee tasting. <laughs> and you know, before dinner, I'd crack a couple of Budweisers and by myself with a big smile on my face, and you know, and then it's like it's cocktails before dinner alone, and in freaking eleventh grade in high school. Where did you Where did you grow? Where was your family based out of? Where did they grow up? So I grew up uh, in the northern suburbs of Baltimore, and um, and then uh, ended up going away to a boarding school that you know uh, I had a long family history that had gone to that was um, super academic and elite in every way, and it was a privilege to get there. And I, you know, one of my many regrets in life is I didn't take advantage of of it as I should. I, I, I spent a lot of time and energy trying to get by and get away with stuff as opposed to maximize the opportunity. Uh, but cool people and still in touch with some, some great people there. And, you know, it's an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable experience. What was and, that like? It was super, in many ways, really healthy for me to kind of get away from home and get independent. And, you know, I don't, I'm a guy who believes I was born an alcoholic. So there's no part of me that thinks, you know, my life would have turned out differently given different circumstances. It just, there's no, it doesn't make any other, I got it, I got it in my gene pool. I, I, I went after it right away. I don't think, um, I don't think some other situation in my life um, would have, would have made it so that I could have successfully handled the stuff. Yeah, I'm the same exact way. I feel like I was just predisposed to it. It's in my family. Uh, I believe that once I started to drink, it re- I, I just know it changed me so much. Uh, that there was there was no turning back. You know, you're at boarding school. Is was it difficult to drink? Uh, and were you just drinking at boarding school, or were there drugs involved too? Well, there was. I mean, it's in those, in that environment, in many ways, you know, this is the '80s, right? So it was. Uh, it's often easier to smoke pot because it's easier to. Con- you know, it's they had school rules and expulsion and all that kind of stuff, and and I triggered a bunch of them. I barely got out. Um, and, uh, and the, um, you know, the, the day I graduated, um, you know, my, I, I slept through breakfast with my parents. I, I go to baccalaureate service and they're sitting in the front row and I'm 20 minutes late. I have to walk all the way up in front of everybody. And, you know, they, they, by three o'clock that afternoon, all my buddies were jumping in cars and going off to somebody's beach house to have senior week and uh, my parents are like so you're going to go to Outward Bound and Hurricane Island you know that's our graduation present to you and I was like okay cool you know great so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to the shore and we got a party and, and they're like no 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 you're like we're going we're leaving right now 
So was that an effort? They were by trying, them? right? Yeah. They, they saw it and they were trying, and you know, so they, they, and and awesome experience. Really glad I did it, right? Definitely what exactly is that? Because I've always heard that people, you know, you heard that somebody would get sent to outward bound or would go to outward bound, but it wasn't rehab. Uh, and no, God, no. It, I mean, you, you know, there's no access to drugs or drinking and, and they kind of fool you a little bit, right? Like they tell you when you're packing your bag, don't bring any money. You're going to be in the woods. Why would, why would you bring money? And then, you know, the next thing you know, you're carrying a canoe down old town, Maine and wishing you had five bucks in your pocket just to get an ice cream cone, yeah. right? Much less, much less a pack of cigarettes or some beer or whatever. So, um, so, you know, they have different length excursions. It's a very awesome program. I'd recommend it for anybody. Okay. You know, it's a, it's outdoor oriented, group oriented. Um, the, the trip I was on was uh, young males and females. And, um, and they intentionally drive you to a physical and mental breaking point at some point in the trip. And then, and then you get a lot of group feedback as to what it feels like to be on the other end of it when you hit your breaking point. And so you learn a lot. Oh, that's pretty um, awesome. And in a cool environment and, you know, soloing and, and starvation and, um, and physical extremity and lack of sleep and, you know, it's, it's not, it's like it, the best case scenario is you hate it when you're on it and you really appreciate it when it's over. Yeah, for sure. And it, it, it you get to know a lot about yourself and it's uh, like, although you guys separated, that's a quite the team building uh, experience. Pete, I had, I had a moment with the counselor who she summed me up. I mean, the woman had known me for 12 days and she took me aside and she said, um, you're just another. <laughs> and the, the problem, and the problem with you is you have the ability to be a leader and you lead people into just a nothing and you're never going to succeed in life until you figure that out. I mean, and that was like, that was the verbatim quote. And I was 18 years old. Now you're a smart guy. It. Were you like, shit, I'm found out. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was just like, how, I mean, she just, like, if anything, I felt bad that I couldn't fake it better than two weeks. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I, and then I was that broken guy who like was intent on proving her wrong, but not by becoming not a just enougher, but by proving her that just enough would be, it would be okay. Like, would, would be enough. <laughs> yeah. I missed the second half of her statement, which is, you know, it's not the way to live life. I, I, I tried to validate that you could succeed that way. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, and I still learn today. You take shortcuts, you're going to feel like shit. Uh, it's just, that's just, that's my experience with it. Yeah, and I mean, I think this woman's point, and, and certainly true to major, many things in my life, it's not only that, it's that I was spending um, so much time and energy um, intentionally trying to do things differently than just following good advice and direction, right? It's, it's one of the, the biggest thing I learned in the program. It's just that the value of somebody else's experience and applying it to my life and the wisdom and just, it gets easier. Following directions. It gets easier. It's just unbelievable, right? Yeah. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I was, I was just like, there was something about me where you, you said black and I wanted to tell you why white was better. So you get done with this outward, outward bound and then do you go back home uh, to, like to, to the Baltimore area and party before you go to school? Where did you go to school? So I went to a school called Hotchkiss and then I went off to University of Vermont. Okay. And, um, you know, and I, I, I worked. I wasn't just a playboy. I, you know, I worked hard. I had jobs, you know, bailing hay and stuff like that for the summer. But they were always in like really cool environments. You know, in in many ways. Um, but your parents were kind of determined to teach you a work ethic, in a sense. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, there's my I, there's I could there's nothing that I did to myself that I could look back on and point my finger at my parents and say. I mean, I tried, right? I, yeah. That was part of the like pig pen, create a dust ball, and it's everybody else's fault. But no, it was you know good people trying really hard, you know, doing stuff like you know, hey, let's let's put them in the woods and, and give them that experience and, and come back in life. And, and I, and I had moments of being really motivated and, and intent on it. And then just, 
you know, couldn't add alcohol and all the, all the best intentions seemed like a bad idea. Did you ever try to stop like when you were in college? Was there ever any, was when, when did the, the you know, the light bulb go off? So in my your brain? freshman year got really dark. You know, I, I failed miserably at college and, and part of it was I couldn't, I couldn't even, I just drank and party and smoked a lot of pot. Um, you know, all, I was in a triple and all three, none of us got asked back. Oh. I mean, we just took it like, and I don't, I don't, I, you know, if I had to own taking those two guys down, I probably should, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't point my finger at them. I just, we were just, neither of us, none of us were healthy for each other, but I, I would have to say I was the instigator. And, um, uh, and, and I had some really dark moments, right? I, I knew I was failing. I was keeping it to myself. I wasn't reaching out for help on any level. And, uh, you know, my and you're kind of just stuffing up. it, right? Uh, totally. Yeah. And, and, you know, real, I mean, really dark, like moments of my brother came, my parents sent my older brother to pick me up from college and he showed up and, uh, and I told him I was expelled and, uh, and I, I don't really remember the conversation, but I was kind of like, I think you better drive. Meaning like, you know, that edge of the cliff might look pretty good. You don't want to be in the car with me. Um, I was in, you know, I was terrified to come back and tell my parents who had, you know, spent a lot of money to make sure that I had a really good education. And I just majored in hanging out and walking around. So you get home and you, so you get home and what happens? I went to my first, you know, my dad was awesome. And, um, my parents were like great at major disasters, you know, not so great (laughs) at like, you know, how come you didn't clean up your room or make your bed? That's yeah, of course. Right. Uh Great, great at, at, uh, like, um, being, uh, balanced in, in the midst of a crisis. And so, um, so it's not like, they're screaming or yelling or anything. It was just, you know, Hey, this isn't dad's super logical guy. And, um, I, I went to my first a meeting. I was, I was, uh, it was May of 1985. And what happened? And, how, how, uh, did, it, how, did it, I mean, what was the impact it had on you? So I got sober. I got sober for, uh, I mean, there was no part of me that didn't buy in right away. There was no part of me that, that um, uh, my my parents arranged for me to go and work for a sober woman in northern Canada for the summer as a job and take care of her. She had a bad back. Uh, and the uh, the requirement that she put on me was that I had to go to an A meeting every day. And, and we were in rural northern Canada on a, in a cabin in a lake. And, you know, that meant, um, you know, on Sundays, uh, the meeting was right in town and I could get there in a boat. And on Wednesdays, it was a, a boat and a hundred mile car ride. Wow. Like it was, you know, there was a meeting every day, but it wasn't it was dirt roads and, and, uh, and it was the same 12 people just one day a week. It was closer to somebody else. Yeah. You're not hopping on and, a zoom. And that's it, for sure. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and it was a really cool experience. And I remember it being really good. And then one day, um, one day it seemed like a really good idea to buy a bottle and drink. And, uh, Were you still in Canada? Yeah, yeah. I got she. This woman kicked me out. She caught me like right away, and uh, and she told me, you know, you know, I came home with tail between my legs, and um, I think I pretended to go to meetings for like another month, and uh, and then my dad sat me down, and he had why this was another like massively profound moment in my life. My dad sat me down. And said, um, you know, what are you doing? And I was like, ah, I'm, you know, I'm good. I said, uh, gave him some line. Um, I, I got, I got meetings on tape. I listened to him in the car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so like, that isn't the way this thing works. Yeah. And, uh, and then he said, he said the thing that just made all the difference, not that moment, but later in my life. He said, um, I said to him, I said, I was like, dad, you know, I really think it was the Coke in the pot and I'm 19 years old. And I just, I've never tried just drinking and I just can't get my head around it right now. And I think I'm going to try life 
like I get the drugs and I get they took me down and but I've never just tried drinking and I'm gonna try that. And uh, he and I didn't I didn't expect him to respond to that well. And uh, he said I totally get it. And that if you're an alcoholic, you'll be the last one to know. And that people in your life will try and tell you and you won't want to hear them. So my advice to you is listen to the people in your life. And that was it. He never, you know, I went on to get kicked out of college a couple of more times. And then let me stop you right there, by the way. That's something that's, that's a little moment that you can use to somebody who you're talking to. Cause that's, that is, I've never really heard it broken down like that. I've heard you mention it before. You'll be the last to know, but to be able to maybe pass that on what your father said to you, to somebody that's, that's trying to bargain with you, right? Cause we all have alcoholics in our life and sooner or later, as you know, they end up maybe being your children or whatever. And they're going to say stuff like that. Right. Cause that's what we do. Um, but it, it's planning that. Hey, scene. I don't, I gotta tell you, like I, I, you know, I think if I'm honest with myself, when I, you know, my immediate reaction to that conversation was like, wow, that went better than I thought. And then <laughs> seven years, you know, seven years later, my wife has my cheeks in both her hands and she's screaming at the top of her lungs, you know, you're an effing alcoholic. And my mind was like, oh, this was what my dad was talking about. Yeah. You know, and there was seven years of, of abject failure and consequences and, you know, moment, you know, good times along the way too. made some great friends and, you know, met a woman and got married and like, wasn't, wasn't all a total disaster, but, um, it, it was a moment for me that created, uh, the moment of clarity for me later in life when it was really time for me, when I had enough. Yeah. And you were still young, so but I want to move. So you you have that conversation. You walk away from your dad, and you're thinking, "Well, that that one that's so alcoholic." I can totally relate. Like, man, that that went well. Uh, and you <laughs> subconsciously you don't even realize that you know, like that was kind of a moment. Yeah, totally right. I was I was expecting to get cut off, and I I didn't yet. So you go back. So you go back. I to, came later. He, so. Your first year at Hotchkiss, by the way, that was, you know, obviously you didn't go back there. Was there a lot of hard drugs in that year? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, for sure it wasn't, I, I wasn't, uh, hard drugs in the 80s was low. Yeah. Uh, we weren't really touching much. That couple, I knew a couple of people doing after. I got to tell you, the drug thing for me, if, you know, there was moments in my life where I, there wasn't anything I didn't try, but deep down inside I knew I had a control issue with this stuff and I was a little wary of the, of hard drugs. Um, you know, like I said, it wasn't like I didn't do them, but I didn't, uh, I knew I couldn't afford a Coke habit and, and I hated, um, I hated chasing people with it. Um, so that, that was the thing for me that was, uh, it actually was very hard when it came time to quit alcohol because I, my experience was I could put down, drugs in a way that I couldn't put down alcohol. Now I, I shifted, I shifted to booze. Um, but, um, you know, I woke up one day and just said, I am, I do not like feeling paranoid and loser and stupid the way I do when I'm stoned and I'm not going to smoke pie anymore. And it was never hard to say no. Like I just never did it again. And frankly, never had plenty of times where people offered it to me and was just, you know, comfortable saying, no, thank you. I don't like how that makes me feel. And, and blow similar thing, just like had enough experiences where I ran out and, and, you know, was knocking on bathroom doors, asking people to let me in so I could get some more. And that felt grunty and crappy. And I just didn't like going down there anymore. So I got to a place where people would offer it to me and I could easily say, no, thank you. Cause I didn't, I could play the tape board and I'd know what it'd be like in six hours. And I didn't want to start that process. And well, those dots never connected with booze. Well, and it's and it's like it almost makes sense that you're kind, you were pretty sincere when you were talking to your dad. It was you know it was this other stuff, and maybe because um, yeah. that's yeah. Because again, you're the last to know. You didn't you didn't know yet. So you go back up, to, or you you what, what led you to Vermont? Uh, I didn't get in anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so and, you, yeah. I, and there was a girl that, you know, I went up and visited, had a great time, tried to play lacrosse, but couldn't because I, frankly, you know, if you can't stay in school, you can't stay on, on an athlete. But you were an athlete. And I, I, I was until I, you know, I was, I was your worst kind of athlete. I was a guy who walked around and acted like an athlete, but I actually ended up, you know, not having eligibility and all that stuff. <laughs> the stuff that comes with, you know, making booze your number one priority. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I didn't go there to play the cross. I went there because it was a fun school and the drinking age was 18 and I got in and, um, and you know, it, I loved it. Like some of my best friends in life are still guys I met, you know, two months into school. And, um, and I, I had an awesome time. I was there for, um, you know, it took me six years to get a four year degree. Um, I learned how to ski, uh, and, you know, beautiful place and beautiful people. And I you know, recommend that place to anybody, honestly. Love it. Yeah, so you were having um, a hell of a time. Yeah, for sure. Any, con- within, any consequences to when, when you're up in Burlington? Well, I mean, I, I literally got accepted into the school four times. Well, what's that mean? I don't know. I don't think they track that record, but I've got, I, you know, I, the last time I was, you know, writing letters and having personal meetings with the being the president. And I was always, I had a great comeback, man. I was, you know, good, good first impression, great comeback. And it just, you know, can never hold on. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, DUIs and yeah, I got a lot of stuff, a lot of, a lot of consequences, but I would say major, right. It's, I mean, and, and, uh, and horrendous fume. And in the end, I, I was taking more credits than I needed, but I needed to get another, you know, three credit A to get my cum up to a two O so they could give me a piece of paper. Yeah. It's a kind of, so you, you finish up there and then you, you're, yeah. it's on, on to New York city, right? I mean, and, and what yeah, kind of, I met this woman and, and, um, we were, um, She's awesome, and we decided to move to New York together and, and um, tried to make a career and kind of live together. You know, I had separate apartments, but sort of ended up living together and eventually got engaged and had a, had a bunch of failure, you know, got fired from a bunch of jobs and um, was in sales but, but didn't work. Um, and, uh, you know, that last um, – got married in 91, and uh, that – that year, 1992, was a dark year for me. It was, uh, I knew I had a problem. And, and I don't think what I had, um, what I never imagined, you know, when, when booze and fun, and maybe you're getting consequences, right? Maybe you're a DUI, maybe, maybe a couple, you, you know, black out and do some stuff you're embarrassed by. But um, I had some, uh, I got to a place where I couldn't catch a bug. Yeah, you know, I was chugging back in the middle of the night, waiting for a bus that never came. And it's really, um, it's really depressing when you, uh, when I was, I was trying to convince myself I was okay. Uh, it's hard to be standing in a closet chugging a bottle of vodka with a voice that's trying to tell you that this isn't alcoholism. Yeah, you're you're okay. Yeah, this is you know how what under what circumstances would this be okay? And you're and you're in a closet because you're married, and now there's somebody else in the picture. Uh, yeah. And I and I have to imagine pressure is building there. So you you mentioned you go to that first meeting in 1985. Any meetings in between, like, and was that like you know you're sober for a no. little while, you're going to meetings in Canada, but no more meetings after that. Nope, just seven more years of of um, getting after it and, and not necessarily, you know, maybe outwardly succeeding. Like met a woman, got married. I don't, you know, often like greatest thing that ever happened in my life. And, and under circumstances, um, maybe the only good thing that was going on during that. And, you know, graduated from college with a really sketchy track record through it. And so, you know, had moments of sort of knuckling down and pulling together and seeing like I was going to figure life out. Um, and uh, made some good friends in New York and had a great time. And and, uh, and then just, you know, I was the kind of guy that, like, 
I'd go out with you on a Saturday and we'd go huge. And, um, and then I'd have another, another guy that I'd go out with on Sunday and another guy I'd go out with on Monday. So you might not know that I was doing it every day of the week. I was just the guy going huge with you on a Saturday. And it's easy to find those people in New York city. Yeah, it's great. Right. Yeah. And, um, and you, uh, and then on top of it, I had, I was closet fishing, right? So I, I had this whole stash that I was, just, you know, I was embarrassed at the quantity that I was consuming. So I didn't let people see it. Rogue 23. That's right. It is here. It's not back. It's here. It's the first one. Join the ultimate celebration of digital content with its creators, passionate fans, and industry experts. It is all happening in downtown Waco across multiple venues, January 20th through the 22nd of 2023. Now, if you want to go, you got to get tickets, and tickets are on sale at roguecon23.com. That's roguecon, R O G U E C O N 23.com. Be there. I'm going to be there. Everybody's going to be there. Let's go. I'm Hank. You might remember me from a show called King of the Hill. Check out Ma, a King of the Hill rewatch podcast. These boys ain't rap, but they are funny. Find the Ma podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at roguemedianetwork.com. I tell you what. <laughs> so, you know, you mentioned to your, your wife, how did you... You, you are somebody who is a real good example of a healthy relationship and sobriety. But before the healthy relationship, there was the drinking. How, how did you pull that off? How did you, and how did, you, how did you not, you know, separate or split up? Because I'm sure you were putting her th- through hell. Yeah, I mean, I don't, gosh, you know, she's... Um, she saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. Maybe I mean I, I think in many ways she she sort of uh, you know we've obviously had conversations about it over the years. I think she she didn't want to admit to herself how bad it was for me. I certainly hit it uh, as best I could. I think there were moments with her that um, you know I, I'll tell you a story. We had our our 15 year wedding anniversary, so I got sober. Uh, a year into our marriage, we had a 15 year wedding anniversary and we're, we went someplace nice, can't remember where, but we were sitting on a beach someplace nice. And, um, she looked at me and said, uh, you know, I hated our wedding day. Um, and I was like, Oh my God, really? You know, tell me about it. And she said, yeah, I just, I felt like I was making a huge mistake. And, um, I said to her, uh, you should listen to that voice. That's a good voice. Like you, you absolutely, like you rolled the dice. Like you got (laughs) the likelihood of, like the number of people that marry an active alcoholic that 15 years later, you know, you're You're sitting sitting on a beach beach together. Yeah. You got it. Like that's very small. Like that voice that told you this might be a big mistake is a really healthy voice. And I'm glad you didn't listen to it, but you know, next time you might want it. Uh, And then I shared with her, you know, I hated our wedding day too. And she said, why? And I said, because all I was trying to do was not get hammered and I couldn't do it. And the, yeah. And you're thinking about how can I control it? Right. And it's so frustrating. Yeah. Just like, I just, re- that's what I remember about my wedding was like just this perpetual need to go and jug a beer and, and knowing that it wasn't appropriate and not to do it. We'll get back to this conversation in a second, but right now a word from our sponsors. You know, and and we'll we'll get to uh, in a moment. Um, you know, to to when you get sober and when things turn around. But while I got you here, uh, talking about you know your relationship with your wife, what are some of the things? I mean, you, you you really speak to it when you say, you know, I'm I'm the luckiest guy in the world. You know, like like you got the deal of the century, right? I mean, and that's kind of the. I don't think that we we're enti- as an alcoholic. I'm entitled, uh, and I you say it. Clint, you know, born on third base, thought you hit a triple. You said that about your yeah. life. I can see that in, in oh. my life too. How do you find the gratitude uh, with your, and I'm not saying you're perfect because we're not, but how do you find the gratitude in your relationship every day or try to? Well, 
it starts from a place where I know I got the better end of the deal. We're just, you know, I, I, like, Pete, we're lucky that there's people out there that will marry people like us. Yeah. My wife married an active alcoholic. We like, we ruined the, the lives of the people that love us the most. Yeah. That's my natural propensity. And I, you know, so when I'm in a good place and when our marriage is in a good place, I, I, that's where I'm coming from. You know, I'm not caught up in like how you're making me feel today. And God, if you would only do this, my life would be better. Right. Like, it's not like I don't have those moments and thoughts and voices, but, but when I come from a grounded place of like, you know, this is a woman who would tell me that I was drunk and I would try and make her feel crazy. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what I do when I, when I'm drunk and, and she stuck by me and she supported me and it, and it was, you know, I was no winner, right? I, I was a guy with, um, legal issues in multiple states and getting fired from jobs. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't super clear to her that I was a guy, I was a great guy to hitch on to that was going to make her life better. Yeah. Or who was going to you know, turn it around. Just, yeah. But she, she was, she's awesome, right? She didn't, she didn't, most people would have walked out. She didn't. And, um, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. And, uh, I, most days I can't believe it. I can't believe that, you know, we've been married 30 years and the most important and best decision I made in my entire life I did as an active alcoholic. And, it's, you know, specifically that's unreal. You, you, one thing you said, she's a great mom and a good, you know, she's awesome. I just, I feel lucky. One thing you mentioned about feelings, uh, you know, as alcoholics, for myself, I, w- I poured so much alcohol and other substances on on every feeling I had for so long that even today, with a little bit of time, I still am so jammed up about sometimes, right? Again, like you said, when I'm when I'm coming from the right place, it's it's all the good stuff. Uh, and for a guy like you, from what I see, there's a lot of coming from the right place. For me, maybe not so much. And you, people get wrapped up, uh, and people being me in this case, about how others make us feel, how situations make us feel. And that's kind of, that that's alcoholic from your experience. Yeah, totally. I mean, that was part of, you know, we're getting into kind of the value of the program and what I've learned through that. But, you know, for me, um, I think you just summarized the the core essence of alcoholism for me, which is, you know, I chased feeling better. And in a way where, you know, I would consciously mortgage my future for the next 15 minutes of fun. I didn't care. Just figure it out later. I need to do this right now. And, and in sobriety, those same instincts are still there, right? Like when I... You know, when I'm doing something that feels great, I'm, my mind is like, how do I make this feel better? And, and when I'm in a bad spot, I don't like how I feel. I'm obsessed with feeling better. And what I've learned is that's really a really bad compass for life. Like, I don't, I make really bad choices when I'm chasing and feeling better. I can, I can do it, I can have moments where I can have fun and do all that sort of stuff, and that's great, and recreation and everything, but that can't be a core driver in life. Right. I mean, you've heard me say it like feelings of the weather. Yeah. They change. Can't control them. Can't control them. And they've got to change. And sometimes and, and in, in your experience and they change kind of rather quickly. Uh, so it's really an unfortunate, <laughs> an, an unfortunate move to make a big decision based on how you're feeling uh, at a, at a certain yeah. time. And in early sobriety, like, you know, the volatility is unbelievable. Right? I mean, I mean, I might be driving down the road feeling fine, and I take a left, and I feel like my life's going to <laughs> Absolutely, you know, yeah. I, re- I remember a bill that I forgot about, and, you know, nothing has changed other than I remember about a bill that I forgot about, and it's like it ruined my day. Yeah, uh-huh. And I might even have money in the bank to pay. It's just it's crazy. I don't know if normal people have voices in their head to do that, but when I talk about it, you know, in a meeting, I certainly get a lot of people who identify. You get right? some feedback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This chatter that goes on all the time and it, and it impacts, you know, how I feel. So, so I solve it with structure and routine and commitment. 
to some stuff that, you know, works and, um, and it keeps me on the beam, right? It keeps me, keeps me feeling grateful for the people that stuck with me when I wasn't a good partner to be with. And it, it keeps me balanced and realizing that like, you know, I'm the lucky one. So and, what, uh, just, go ahead. No. So, what you, got? you you know, I got, I, I got plenty more. Hold on. I won't keep you forever, but you get sober. What happens? Is there a moment specifically where, you know, you mentioned your, your wife's ending up holding your cheeks. It's 1993 or 92 was a terrible year. What leads up to you bottoming out? Um, yeah, that was, that was, well, so, um, in that moment that I already described to you that you just reiterated, um, I had two thoughts. So I had the thought that, oh my God, this is what my dad was thinking about. And then I had, my next thought was, good, she's going to leave and then I can drink the way I want to drink. And then right afterwards, I, I was horrified. I was horrified that that's actually what I thought and that the idea of choosing alone with a room full of booze was more appealing than being there with this woman. Um, I, I just knew I was sick. And, uh, and so I gave her the reins and, um, you know, and I, I did not go to inpatient rehab, but I, I went. So you gave her, you gave her the reins and you said, Hey, whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. Yeah. Like I just, you know, had that, had that moment that we all need where we just say, yeah, I give up. I'm going to stop. Like, throwing the walls up and trying to convince you everything's fine and admitting that I can handle this by myself. I, I had, you know, for the four or five or six months before, I I tried all those things that are in our book that says we tried and failed in a way where I was willing to admit that I couldn't do it by myself. And so what's her next move? What's your next move? What ends up happening? So she made some phone calls and, you know, I, I had rehab as an option and somehow I talked my way out of it. I, I frankly, what I remember was, um, you're so, you're I still at it, lack, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I yeah. had such a lack of confidence that I felt like I wanted to save rehab. <laughs> <laughs> For when it gets worse. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm going to keep that one in the bag in case I really need it. Right. So, uh, so I, I started going to meetings and I, I committed to a 90 and 90 and, and, and that was not my last drink, but it was, um, it started a process of a full commitment of going to, um, 12 step meetings and, and developing a community and, and, um, and my just enough uh, mentality is, is how I approached AA and did not have a tremendous amount of success in it. Uh, never, never gave up, but, you know, tried to do, try, you know, I was on a mission to figure out how little I could do to quit drinking. And, and over the course of the next two years, I came to believe that that wasn't really the goal. The goal is to do everything I can possibly do to find a good life. Um, and I mean that sincerely, like it's too, you know, uh, you could, you can, you can lean on recovery and listen, anybody that has what I have, if, if, if alcohol and drugs just stop ruining their lives, good for them. And I have no judgment on it, but there's this other thing out there, which is like, uh, which on, on good days I I'm in touch with, which is like a great life, like a, a life that is better than anything I thought I'd ever have. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't like myself. I, I learned how to shave in the shower without looking in a mirror because I didn't like looking at myself. I mean, that's real. When you say that, that's real. That's not just a, some kind of cliche or something you throw out there. You really couldn't look in the mirror because you hear people say that. I couldn't, I couldn't, I still do it. I still shave in the shower without a mirror. It's just like one of the little hangovers from, and you know, now I'm not, I'm not winking at myself in the mirror, but I'm not avoiding it either. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Love that's you, boy. staying grounded. Uh, so you you you're one one of the things too. New York is a 
wonderful place for people to get sober, especially I would think in the early nineties, because you know, you can, you really, that 90 and 90 is right at your fingertips. Uh, there's actually, oh, you got no excuse, right? Yeah. There's a meeting, there's a, there's a clubhouse in every neighborhood that has a meeting every other hour, you know, starting at 5 a.m. and going till midnight. What kind of meetings did you um, go but to? I then? will what? tell you, I did not, I, we, we moved out of New York relatively quickly. I, the part of New York that, um, that baffled me about people who stay sober there is that, um, there's, there's so much social life around alcohol you know you live in a if you're young you, you live in a pretty small environment and you're not you're not having people over to your apartment you're meeting in bars and restaurants and um you know it's not that you can't find other stuff it's just you know getting out of the city in general uh there's more social activity around and camaraderie that isn't alcohol focused yeah so you guys so you you, you do your 90 and 90 and then when do you when do you end up Slipping up and drinking again. So I drank uh, a year into sobriety. Uh, that's November. So I first came in in September of '92. Um, certainly had a couple of you know breakdowns and some drinks, and it wasn't continuous sobriety throughout that whole period. But it wasn't. I never went on a bender. And then uh, you know a couple of different thirty day coins and that kind of stuff. And then um, uh, November of ninety. Three, I went on a hunting trip in Vermont with some college buddies and, um, and you know, we kind of gutted it out the first night and drank the second night. And, um, and dude, super, super grateful I did. I mean, at the time, I'm grateful I did now because it answered a question for me that was running in my head that whole first year, which is, you know, do I have another good night in me? Uh, never, never a question of whether I was an alcoholic, never a question of whether, uh, you know, long-term I needed to stop drinking, but just what I flirted with and what I massaged was this idea that I could still have, you know, I could sneak, I could sneak a good night in every once in a while. And, um, and it kind of freaked me out. It was, uh, that, that last night of drinking was, was no different than the second to last night of drinking. Um, and, uh, and it, it made me believe that this was physical. I, I was sure that being totally clean for over a year, I was going to catch a huge prize and it was going to be awesome. And that wasn't how it played out. And uh, so we came back and, you know, started the clock all over again, day one. What do you tell people that, that come back in and out? You know, like, like you said, here you are, what, 28 years? Yeah. And, and you're, you're, you were sitting there with, uh, with a couple of 30 day chips, you know, several in your hand at one point or, or, you know, you, in your possession, what do you, what do you tell folks that they are in and out? So, um, I tell people, this is what I tell people. Um, I say, uh, imagine the person you love most in your life comes to you and says, um, I need help. I have a problem with drug and alcohol. What should I do? And and take out a piece of paper and a pencil and write down absolutely everything you would tell that person to do. Um, and, you know, for the most people who actually do this, it's not a short list, right? There's the obvious stuff like go to a meeting, do a 90-90, um, get phone numbers, right? And then there's the granular stuff, which is, you know, call a person before you go to the bar or before you go and cop or um, you know, uh, not just get a sponsor, but let them, let them in and really, uh, get honest with somebody, like just trust somebody and let them hear all the crazy stuff. So you write all that stuff down. Um, and then circle the stuff you're willing to do and then do it. And then if it doesn't work, take out the piece of paper again and circle two more things and do it. Yeah. And, and eventually you get to, you know, for me, I got to what is my program, right? So my program, like I mean, you can do all 30, if you come up with 30 or 35 or whatever the number is, like do it all. It's, you, you're definitely going to, it's definitely going to work and you're definitely going to find a happy life. But you know, my experience is it's the nature of who we are with that. That nobody tries it that way. <laughs> I think we all are trying to figure out like, you know, What's my the least problem, amount? Yeah. I, so I had this guy, I had this sponsor and God, he's awesome. Right. And he took me aside one day and he said, uh, why don't you want to have a spiritual awakening? 
And you know what that means, right? There's the, the, the 12th step of, of the 12th step says, you know, uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And what he, what he was really saying to me is, you're not doing the work. And I don't understand why you're not doing the work, but I see that you're not doing the work. Why don't you want the end result? Of it? And, and he wanted an answer. I mean, he just sat, sat there and didn't say anything and looked me in the eye and he wanted me to answer it. And I answered him, I thought about it, and I answered him as honestly as I could at the time. And what I said to him was, it, it's not that I don't want to have a spiritual awakening. I just don't want to do what you did to get it. Yeah, that, and, that's, yeah and I, that sounds familiar. <laughs> I think that's a really common, like, I think that's, you know, people who are early to this thing, that's a pretty common thing, right? We, we just, it's not that we don't want it. We just, for me, it was a combination of not really believing it, not understanding how cool it was. I mean, you know, it, when you when you finally, I got to a place where I liked who I was, and I liked my life, and it worked. And and what I did to get there was, you know, I beat myself up a lot, I took a lot of punches, and I tried the hard way a lot. And then I finally, ultimately, what started working for me was the stuff that that you know half the stuff they tell you as a third grader, and I missed it then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you can be too, quote unquote, you know, too cool to get this thing. You're too cool to understand how cool it is almost because you don't want to do the bullshit. Uh, and, and the more and more you compare yourself out, the more and more you're making yourself subject to, you know, fatality nowadays, right? I mean, just, just going out there and dying. You, you stick around. How does your life start to change? What gears are you able to discover in sobriety? Yeah, and, and you can you can absolutely overthink it, right? I overthought it. It's like I, the the life and the what I call my program, what I live today, is is infinitely more simple than I thought it would be. Yeah. Even even the whole higher power thing, I I struggled with that whole concept. I didn't, you know, I just didn't. Um, I don't. I would think I was truly. Uh, um, I, I just didn't understand. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a sense of it. Um, I didn't deny it, uh, but I, I really questioned it and I really struggled with um, bad things happening to good people. And I, I didn't understand people that could believe in a God where bad things happen to good people. Uh, good things happen to bad people. I just, I couldn't get a logic tree in where it all made sense for me. And, uh, and I had a, you know, I had this guy who, um, one, there was one moment where I, I told him one day, you know, when you, you start getting real honest with somebody and I started telling him what was really going on in my head and some of the thoughts I had. And I said to him, I said, you know, I kind of feel like I have a voice in my head that tells me what the right thing to do is. And I just, I, I rarely listen to it. And, um, and he just very casually said, like, how cool would that be if that voice was your higher power? I kind of, you know, looked at him and I was like, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, why don't you, why don't you just listen? Every time you hear that voice for the next two weeks, why don't you do what it tells you to do and then get back to me? And, you know, I ran into him like 10 days later. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Is this what this thing is? <laughs> like, my life got better instantly. Yeah. But when the, when the I dust thought, clears, it, the, the answer is what, inside us, right? I mean, when yeah, when we rip that me, film just, off, yeah, yeah, stop debating, stop justifying. You know, the real simple stuff. Like if it's got to be a secret, then it's not it. <laughs> right? Real simple filters. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. If it's got to be a secret, yeah. that is not it. Yeah. Right. Like I just needed some real clear, like, and that was, you know, for, for your average kid who went to Sunday school in third grade, like they figured that out. I was, you know, 28 years old and, and hadn't yet applied that to my life. So when you do apply it, what, what kind of stuff starts to happen for you? Well, that's the magic, right? The magic happens. Stuff happens that you can't even explain. Just life gets easy. Like in, in a way that doesn't even make sense. Business gets easy, relationships get easier, you know, um, just less tension, sleep better, like some instant really traumatic things that, that couldn't be, be a logic tree doesn't have it related. It's just what we call the magic. 
You said and, something. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you said something the other day about just how much your life has even changed, you know, from being, I don't know, 15 years ago, however many years you had then, to to now. Just when you practice these principles, like the principles that we learn in 12 steps, right, in sobriety, when, you can, when you're able, the answer is integrating them in all of the things you have. You know, I like to decide, okay, my priority today is going to be work, and tomorrow, uh, you know, I'll get to a meeting. And it's all, it's all one, right? It's a spider web. It's all woven together. I think a lot of people, myself, um, I'm talking about really, uh, you, you struggle with that. Um, integrating sobriety into, because it's like, oh, I can't go to a meeting today. I've got work to handle. But really, if you go to the meeting, everything is going to take care of itself as far as work is concerned. You've experienced that. Yeah, well, I get, you know, and, and I don't want to come across like I'm really great at this and, you know, I'm, I don't, I make plenty of mistakes um, and I get plenty of regrets. Yeah, we can but always I, we can always get your wife on if she. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, totally right. And yeah. but I subscribe to this process. But what I do, I have to own it and apologize to him, right? So that's the that's the beauty of it. But um, you know, the, so that spiritual awakening that that guy challenged me to go get that eventually motivated me to follow the directions that definitely leads to that. For me. Uh, was way more pragmatic than it was spiritual, right? It was just this idea that, um, you know, I had all these things I wanted in my life and I went about it by being a taker. And it turns out if you become a giver, um, I end up getting better than what I ever wanted, not doing it the way I tried to do it. And, and you learn that, you know, there's no way you learn, you learn that if you're not an alcoholic. Yeah. And, and, and the, you know, what we subscribe to promotes being a giver, right? It promotes being there for other people and caring about other people and reaching out and all that kind of stuff. And, and as that, as, as you see that working in the community we're in, it's not hard to try and apply it to work. Or it's not hard to try and apply it to family. And, you know, it's a, which doesn't mean I get great relationships with everybody and extended family or anything like that. It's just, it's, it's more about, you know, where, what am I trying to achieve and what do I need to do? Or where am I, am I trying to create a relationship with somebody in a way that, you know, they're never going to value it, reciprocate it. So, you know, maybe that's just somebody I'm not going to have a relationship with and that's okay too. What about, you know, you from, from 30,000 feet, your life is looking, you know, out of this world. I'm not going to deny you any of the hardships you had. Uh, in achieving things along the way or just hardships because of mistakes. I mean, you, you mentioned it, nobody's perfect, but on paper, things are going swimmingly. And then, you know, we mentioned Timmy, right? Your son, uh, yeah. Timmy didn't wake up and decided he wanted, you know, wanted to get into the recovery field, you know? Um, <laughs> so he, no. he, he found his way there. Uh, and you, and you were a big part of that. I mean, it was, it was, that might be a whole separate podcast. <laughs> I know, but I have to, I have to touch on it. I mean, just as a guy, I was going to meetings around the Philadelphia area. Tim came back home, uh, you know, and the story you, people can find it wherever they want. He gets caught up in this whole situation with drugs, dealing drugs with guys locally, um, that he went to high school with. And it, it's one of these things where because of the area, it's in, this is my opinion, you can please stop me or interject or, or get it straight after I'm done. But because of the area that it's in, I mean, they they took this story and it was like they injected it with steroids. And, and the next thing you know, you got these couple white collar kids who are on Good Morning America um, because yeah, they were selling weed. And the, the shit had hit the fan. And oh, by the way, here's dad who is, you know, decades sober. I, I mean... It, I guess the only blueprint blueprint for that is sobriety, but how do you handle that? Well, I mean, there's the, uh, you know, first off, uh, we just got a lot of help and, and there's, you know, uh, for anybody who's never been in a crisis, you know, one of the most amazing things is, uh, there's people that show up that carry you through. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to name them, but they know who they are. 
And, and some of them aren't ones you'd expect. Some of them are new people in our lives and, and other people that you, you sort of count on. Um, AA was there in a huge way, right? So you kind of expect that and you know it. I leaned on it really heavily. So we didn't try and do it alone, and, and there were a lot of components to it. The, the biggest part that was, uh, you know, so very, very quickly in the process, you know, my I didn't know any of this stuff was going on, right? So, so my first step was like, you know, A, I, I'm going to assume I can't really trust what he's going to tell me, given the fact that, you know, he wouldn't be in this situation if he was being straightforward to start with. So I was like, I spent the first couple of days just trying to figure out, like, is this is this a guy in a business venture or is this an addict who was being an idiot? And it pretty quickly became clear to me that it was the latter. Yeah. And that gave me singular focus, right? You outsource the legal stuff. Um, we had some folks help out with the media, but it was crazy. I mean, right? there's we cameras had, outside your house. Front lawn and, yeah, totally. And, and, you know, and, and then, um, and some of the stuff, you know, you think back, Pete, and you're grateful for the little lessons that you try and give your children along the way. So, you know, one of the things that I've told all my kids is that, you know, we're the lucky ones. We're the lucky ones. Like, you know, in a very, um, real way, like we're, we're, you're, you're a white male who's grown up in a really wealthy suburb with access to elite schools and vacations and country clubs and nobody is ever going to feel sorry for you. And I, and I mean it and I don't mean they should. And, and it just, you like recognize, like, I, I mean, I'm a guy who's, I've taken my kids to a slum in Kenya to expose them to, you know, how millions and millions of people in this world really live and just to try and get some sense of gratitude in their, in their life and some clarity. It's hard. It's hard to, you know, um, get kids not to, um, to be around in the, in the areas that we go up and be around and access to wealth and, and comforts and not to take them for granted and feel entitled to them. And, and it was one of the things that I, I learned too late in life. So one of the things that I had told my children, like, you know, don't put a bullseye on your back, right? There's, there's plenty of people out there that would love to see people like us go down and don't ever give more. Like, you know, our obligation in life when you're given so much is to give back and make the world a better place. And, um, and you know, Timmy missed that memo and, and he hurt, learned a really hard lesson and he owned it. And, and now he lives that memo, right? And, um, it, it, to me, it's, it's unbelievable. I don't, I don't, I have no idea what the odds are for a kid in his situation to end up where he is now. But man, I would, it's unbelievable. I'm so grateful. It's amazing. I mean, it's amazing the, the work he does in sobriety. I got, you know, we're, we're all kind of connected. Um, in this in this great thing uh, in sobriety, we're involved in it, and he's constantly talking to other guys. Hey, I got a kid. I need you to sponsor. You know, one of the kids in the house, and it's just he's keeping people involved by being involved, and it's a it's a pretty awesome thing. You were so involved in recovery. You know, again, I was around that area at the time the shit hit the fan, and you walked it. You walked in those rooms. You'd got your hand up, and you would share, and you would talk about the circumstances you were in, which were ugly at the time and how you felt, how you were scared, how you didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, you know, here was a guy who you never walked around like you had it all figured out, but you certainly hadn't hit a wall like this, but you were very, you were vulnerable. Um, and then, you know, I get to see you now on the other side of this and, uh, you're, you're as light as a feather. I mean, that, that I can't even imagine what an experience that would be like. But you, but you, yeah. you walked I mean, through it in the rooms of recovery. I mean, I, Pete, I, I can't even explain it. Other, I just look at it sort of pragmatically. Like, you know, there's three or four moments in my life where all I could see was darkness, and I couldn't imagine a pathway out where I'd have another good day, and and I was wrong every time. And so now I just embrace that idea. Right. Like I just accept the fact that my head spins 
a bad scenario into a worse scenario and can't see light at the end of the tunnel. And, and that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's how it's going to end. And, you know, hats off to Timmy for doing what he did. I just don't, I don't, I don't, you know, people ask me all the time, right? So, so it was public. It, it was in the media, you know, it's kind of, no, there's no anonymity or confidentiality as to what happened. And frankly, I'd rather tell people what really happened because most of the stuff in the newspaper wasn't accurate. Um, but, um, you know, so, so I get parents reaching out and I get the kids reaching out and, you know, what did you do? How do you do it? And, and I, I literally say, like, listen, if we did a hundred things, I would do all 100 again because I don't really know which ones matter. I don't. What I know is that it was really clear to me Timmy had an addiction problem. He had a legal problem, he had a media problem, and an addiction problem. And the only thing I knew how to deal with was the addiction problem. And I didn't, and I knew I wasn't going to be the guy to do it, but I knew that there was a pathway. Because with family and stuff like of, that, it's it's just, you know, you did a great job by handing them off to, to guys you trusted in the program, and they kind of took the reins from there. Yeah, well, I mean, it was really, it was obvious, right? If he listened to me, he wouldn't be where he was, so he wouldn't have listened <laughs> to me. Um, and, and uh, but, so I'll, I'll give you one takeaway, and, and this is a big model that's in his synergy houses right now. Is you know I asked him as he got healthy and well, and uh, we got really close because of uh, just the nature of the. He got honest, and it brought us close together. Um, and he needed help. Uh, but in retrospect, I've asked him like you know of all the things we do, what what do you think was what's something that really you think made a difference? So one of the things he said was um, I connected him with people like you. Right, like you, you connected me with people that made sobriety look appealing, and um, and you know, guys like you and Pete and Scott, <clears throat> you know, did what you do, right? And you, you take the phone call and you're like, yeah, I'll take him out to lunch and breakfast and talk to him, yeah. and, and Mike and you know, golfing and and sit with him in a movie theater and and um, and so that that component of it has been something I've adopted since, which is uh, very practically like, I don't, I don't know that we always do people, you know, who the guy who comes in and he's on his third meeting and he's shaking and sweating and, and doesn't know what's up and wrong. And, and the advice we give him is, um, you know, find somebody who has what you want and, and ask him to be your sponsor. Right. So that's typical advice. Mm. Yeah. You know, I don't know that we do that person the right service. I think what we could do is say, you know, Hey, let me let me find you a sponsor who I think would be a really good person for you because his that the person that might change that guy's life might only show up. He might be 25 years sober and shows up at, at a 7 a.m. meeting in Rosemont that that, that dude is never going to go to yeah. meet that guy. Yeah. And uh, and you know you you're in touch with guys and so out. So I think that's part of the model, which is to say, hey, you know, there's people out there in our community that are willing to help. And, and live it and happy to sponsor people and, and have their number on speed dial and answer the phone when somebody's struggling. And, and those of us that have been around can do a better job of, of connecting people. Yeah, I mean, you just get Not it's, just letting it be the first person that comes up and, and hopes that they're the right person to change yeah, their Yeah, almost like you would in business, in a sense. Just connect, connect people that can, that can help one another. Um, yeah, don't just, easy, don't right? just, your, your role doesn't end at find somebody. That has what you want. Um, and, and by the way, because we're, we're, we're kind of running out of time. So things end with Tim. I mean, they don't end, but here he is now. He went to college to Richmond to play lacrosse, gets bounced out of there because of injuries and, and, and whatever else. He ends up at home, faces trouble with the law, ends up, you know, going to going to prison, right? Yeah. For, for seven months, eight months. Yeah, he went to county jail and did his time and, and then he comes out and he Got wins out. a championship, uh, sober, yeah, he many to, years. Uh, goes to college, plays lacrosse again, wins a freaking NCAA Division three championship, you know, learns a lot about himself and team camaraderie and leadership and meets an unbelievable girl who's an angel in life who, you know, 
carried him through in the moment that he needed somebody to carry him through, got married, just had a baby a month ago. Like, dude, it's crazy. It's yeah. nuts, man. And, 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 you know, there are times like, Kill. like it's just, it's, you can't even believe it, but I will tell you one thing. Yeah. So we can say all that at his sentencing hearing. I counted it up. There was 600 years of sobriety that showed up. At that meeting. I mean, at that, at, at that hearing. At his sentencing hearing. Oh, wow. I mean, it's like, and, and guys that were, um, you know, I wasn't allowed. You can go, you can take an A meeting to, to uh, jail, but you've got to go through a, a qualification process. Uh-huh. And uh, I wasn't able to meet the process because my son was in that jail. Okay. And, you know, guys that were in that, that showed up to that sentencing meeting, you know, specifically went through and jumped through the rings of fire so they could go in and, and give them a bump, uh, and an A meeting. Like it's like, uh, it, it just, it was unbelievable. Like the community that showed up to support him and me and it just, there are no words. Well, and it's you know, and here he is giving back to it today. We're we're short on time. Do you have any anything else, Clint? I mean, and, and, and what what do you? I always ask this question too. What do you tell the person that's just trying to get a day? I would say um, I've so been there, and I so get it. And if if you're thinking about anything else other than how to put your head on the pillows over that night you're thinking about the wrong thing. Just get a day. Just get a day. I got, I got 90 days literally because every day I said, if I feel like this tomorrow, I'm definitely going to drink. And then I'd wake up and I feel the same way. And I'd say, if I feel like this again tomorrow, I'm definitely going to get a drink. Today is not the rest of your life. And, and you know, we all, you know, here's a here's a great line that I use all the time, which is, uh, you know, we all have this phrase when we're out there, and it's and it's one day, right? It all it's, everything starts with one day. You know, one day I'm going to be a better husband. One day I'm going to be a better employer. One day I'm going to um, I'm going to quit drinking. One day I'm not going to drink so much. One day I'm going to be a good dad. And if you take one day and you turn it around, it becomes day one. Uh, and that's all this is, right? Just make today day one. Pick, just, just be day one today and take all those things that I'm committed to do, that I really believe I'm going to do, but today doesn't feel like the right day to do it and make today the day. Day one, I love it. Clint, you're the man, dude. All right, buddy. I appreciate, love what you're doing. Yeah, I appreciate your time, dude. Thanks for being <clears throat> and, and And Pete, listen, I am so glad you're back in my life. I really, truly am, and uh, uh, I love you tons. And watch it. I just feel, you know, you just you're a great guy, and uh, appreciate you a lot. I love you, Clint. It's great to be on the ride with you, man. I appreciate it. All right, I probably see, see you. Thanks so much for listening to the Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, and of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast. Join the ultimate celebration of digital content with its creators, passionate fans, and industry experts. It's all happening in downtown Waco across multiple venues on January 20th through the 22nd, 2023. Tickets are on sale now at roguecon23.com. I'm Hank. You might remember me from a show called King of the Hill. Check out Ma, a King of the Hill rewatch podcast. These boys ain't right, but they are funny. Find the Ma podcast anywhere you get your podcasts or at roguemedianetwork.com. I tell you what, (laughs) 
Hmm.